Oil prices hit record lows this summer and remain depressed. Energy companies are struggling to find investors and projects have been shuttered, jobs lost. Demand for fuel has been hit, of course, by COVID. Fewer cars on the road, not going to stores that are closed or to jobs that are no longer uh, available or that no longer exist. And there's a new government south of the border who's indicated that it may be a bleaker future for energy projects here in Canada. Our guest is usually worried about gas prices going up, but there are many complicated issues on the table. Dan McTeague in Parliament for 18 years. That's where I remember him from. He's now president of Canadians for Affordable Energy and runs a new service called Gas Price Wizard. Now, you were with something called Gas Buddy for five years. That was founded in Saskatchewan, and then it was just sold. Is that right? That's right, and uh, has gone through several uh, ownerships, but it's uh, uh, certainly a, a prize of, uh, of Canadian ingenuity, being able to provide people with up-to-date uh, information as to gas prices, as well as getting people to participate. And of course, my element of interest for the three years I was supposed to be there, turned out to be five, yeah. uh, was predict gas prices. And so hopefully uh, at the end of the day, helping people make ends meet. Well, in Saskatchewan, we aim to please. So, you know, we you just do. wanted to do that. <laughs> so you've taken over president of uh, Canadians for Affordable Energy. And basically what you're saying is that you believe energy affordability in this country is under attack. So let's just dig into that. Well, it's not just under attack. I think it's taken for granted. Uh, we are a nation that is uh, blessed with an abundance of resources. Uh, we have over the century or more been able to extract and use those resources, not just to provide a higher standard of living, but to also support our very much our uh, our social programs uh, to provide people uh, with a better life, uh, clean, affordable energy that uh, provides uh, not only the bulwark for our transportation, mining, and agricultural sector, but also provides us with a standard of living in terms of employment, government revenues. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and really one of the main reasons I think Canada has been so attractive. Uh, and for that reason, it's being under attack by uh, technocrats, people who have this idea that somehow you can mess with what works very, very well or ignore how to continue to make that uh, that particular segment of the economy uh, function properly at a time when governments are spending, at a time in which uh, uh, they we're running up the huge uh, public debt in terms of uh, fighting this pandemic, at a time when we're using more equipment requiring fossil fuels uh, to fight and combat uh, this pandemic, we're nevertheless uh, seeing sort of uh, an odd, bizarre spectacle of politicians, some of course in the media, but certainly those behind the scenes and organizations well-funded trying to find ever more creative ways to literally shut down Canada's uh, oil and gas and energy sector, the likes of which uh, would mean a 10 to 15 percent drop in our GDP. So uh, it's, it's kind of a parallel world that we live in, but energy affordability is at the core of why I think Canadians enjoy being Canadian. Uh, it's not just the question of uh, being united, it's also a question of recognizing, I think, that we live a much better life uh, when we're in an environment where everything is a lot more affordable and uh, you know, jobs are plenty. Well, I'll tell you in the part of the world that I come from uh, in April when the farmers already hit by this pandemic, already in trouble because China was no longer buying canola, one of our major exports, then get hit with the increase in the carbon tax. Even that wasn't stalled for for people who were being just uh, just decimated. Yeah, and a, a, a carbon tax, which absolutely does not do anything to reduce the emissions. Not that the is issue of emissions should be a big deal for Canada. Mm -hmm. We produce what, one and a half, one and a quarter percent of the global emissions on carbon. Uh, we are in virtually a carbon sink. But even if we were able to sell some of our clean technology and our clean energy, including natural gas, to places like China, uh, we still wouldn't get credit for it under the terms of a very poorly crafted and, uh, and a very poorly designed idea to support the Paris Climate Accord. Of course, the United States, they're cheering the fact that this would be a great thing. They can achieve uh, emission reduction uh, of 30% below 2005 simply by shutting down their coal plants. Something in many parts of the country, my province, for instance, we did years ago. In fact, we've right. been using nuclear energy for quite some time. But it does suggest that when you apply a carbon tax 
on consumers and on the agricultural sector and others during the midst of a pandemic, you clearly have your priorities wrong, but it shows you the extent of which uh, uh, this government is committed to making uh, all sorts of mistakes to push a very, very dangerous ideology on all of us. I, I'm surprised to hear you uh, say some of these things because, of course, Dan, you were a liberal for many, many years. That's the banner you uh, uh, you ran under, and you recently said that that you see your your party as a climate cult. That's pretty tough language. It is because it's not the same party I served under. Now, Pamela, I was there from 1978, working for Paul Cosgrove, all the way to 19. 19- 84, uh, shifted over to a friend named Derek Lee, worked for him on the Hill uh, in 1988. I've been a, a liberal in the trenches, so I pretty much know this party. And my, my roots go back a lot further to uh, a, lot, a lot of people that uh, may be forgotten by this generation or this iteration of liberals, uh, Jack Pickers, Gills, Senator Keith Davey, people that I knew, knew personally and looked up to. This is not the same party. This is a party that's driven by a particular ideology, which I think is pernicious and dangerous, specifically to Canada, a nation which uh, relies on not just energy affordability, but relies on the energy sector in order to drive its economy, uh, and for which is the envy of the world. But we're simply taking the baby and throwing that out with the bathwater. And it's for that reason that this party has uh, simply gone into not just the cult of, of, of climate, but the cult of personality, identity politics, cancel culture, virtue signaling, these are all things that were very foreign to guys like us and people like mm-hmm. us in the Liberal Party 20 years ago. It still is to most of us today. And I think there is a level of um, people just don't understand the degree to which the energy sector uh, buoys the economy in many other places, despite the fact that we can't ship energy east, which would make sense. We've still got foreign oil coming down uh, the St. Lawrence and from yeah. other places when we could supply that need. But there's an awful lot of uh, processing that goes on here, all of the products, the manufacturing that relies on this. It's not just guys uh, working on projects at Fort Mac. Like This is kind of an integral part of our economy. Yeah, the petrochemical sector, the asphalt sector, uh, the uh, the styrenes, the, the chemicals that we use to use for our textiles, to our shirts, to the plastics that we need. And by the way, the war on plastics is just another dimension of the crazy climate cultishness of this particular party at this time, because it's not based on, on sound evidence that uh, there is a need uh, to ban the very thing that has promoted and bolstered our economy. But I live in Ontario, you know, every year, this, the health of the oil and gas sector drives 40, $45 billion in economic activity. That is worth about 15 to 20% of our economy. Think of the, you know, here in Toronto, we, we make a big deal. We're the financial center of, of Canada. Uh, you know, if you take away the oil and gas sector, you won't be lending money. You won't be uh, providing insurance and you certainly won't be manufacturing. So, you know, we have a tendency in good times to look this oil and gas gift course in the mouth. And it's not just the economic dimension that I'm concerned about, which liberals are ignoring, it's the political one because you're driving a wedge between regions of this country that no one would have ever thought possible in 2015. Well, here we are now, a nation on the precipice of economic ruin, potentially leading to significant uh, dislocation uh, on a regional basis, the likes of which I haven't seen, certainly, uh, you know, going back uh, to the early days of 1980 and the Western Canada concept and all of the other uh, yeah, alienations. There's, there's a lot of political fallout from this that either people don't see or don't care about, but it is there and it exists. And this is not just a handful of so-called Western separatists. It's people that feel disaffected and disenfranchised and that's a whole other issue now we've got um the the conflicting messages from south of the border uh joe biden saying that he will transition from the oil industry i think everybody knows we're going to do that over the longer haul i think it's about time frame um and then of course in the the last days of the campaign sort of reversing his position on fracking but nevertheless they used to be our biggest customers then they became more self sufficient self sufficient mm-hmm. now they're our competitors how is this relationship going to unfold do you believe well politics aside i think the reality is that the the dynamic and the breakthrough of fracking uh, may have reached its uh, its maximum I, financially it's not viable now that's maybe true of even Canadian oil, but mm-hmm. when you open up, uh, you know, a, an oil sands operation, 
the cost of running that is far less than having to move a, a rig in a structure, you know, several kilometers away to, to frack and to break and, and to release uh, natural gas or oil. So for a lot of onlookers, the idea that fracking is, uh, is a virtual money pit uh, is just not on. And I think you're going to see a lot more consolidation and trouble with the U.S. fracking economically. I also, however, believe that uh, given the massive investments that American refiners have made, and let's make no mistake about this, the United States will continue to be the largest consumer of gasoline and diesel and aviation fuel in the world bar none. China is not there yet. It may be another 10 or 15 years before they eclipse them. What we have to recognize is that in the two largest production areas of oil, that is the U.S. Gulf Coast and the U.S. Midwest, most of those refineries have made massive configurations to accept heavy slates of oil. You can do more with it. It's more economical. Uh, mm -hmm. Unlike natural, uh, unlike uh, fracked oil, which of course has a very low density, there's not a lot you can do with it and certainly not as profitable. And it's for that reason that uh, Canadian oil becomes much more favorable in normal times. More importantly, Venezuela, Mexico, Iran, even Saudi Arabia, uh, for, our, for a variety of reasons, are no longer in a position where they can supply that heavy oil. So, like it or not, American security of the 1980s and 1990s and the quest for it also included a significant amount of Canadian oil. As long as we continue to build pipelines to that country, we're going to continue to be able to build out and sell more oil, provided, of course, obstructions don't stop that. And I think that's something that the president, a pragmatic president, will recognize. Yes, as you said at the outset, it will take a long time. But I think that's another 20 to 30 to 40 years off. For now, the world will continue to increase its appetite for fossil fuels, not decrease it because it's ubiquitous and it's at the center of pretty much the entire global industrial economy. So you believe that there might yet again be a market for us in the United States, provided we can get it there? There is and will be, and we can't rail it all. Um, the reality right. is that Keystone is not just about shipping oil to the rest of the world. Keystone is very much XL, is also about additional pipelines at capacity getting to the United States. And here's another problem. Of course, it just came up last week, but it's been sort of percolating for a while. Line 5 and bridge. Right. You know, 540,000 barrels a day. The governor there who hates pipelines, along with her hate, you know, her, her spiteful attorney general has been trying since before they were in office to kill these pipe, this particular pipeline. You know, how are we going to get oil back to Canada? How are we going to run our economy? Yeah. You mentioned at the outset, you know, we import 750,000 barrels. Are we now going to go to a million and a half barrels a day of Saudi and U.S. oil just to meet our, our needs? That's insane. And it will mean a, a, a massive collapse in the value of the Canadian dollar, which increases the price of every single commodity we consume in this country. So defend your dollar by defending your oil sector, or you're going to wind up in the poorhouse, all of us collectively. So she's already made that announcement in uh, in Minnesota. Minnesota, what do you I mean? What do you think is going to happen? Well, look, uh, Governor uh, Whitmer um, is going to have to go to court on this. She's done everything she could in her her capacity to block uh, the uh, redoing of his pipeline. I mean, it's a almost an inch thick. It's at the very bottom. the The proponent, uh, the builder, Enbridge, is prepared to put a tunnel under uh, mm. the uh, the Straits of Michilimackinac, and is prepared to. Uh, if necessary, uh, achieve the most, the safest pipeline record in the world. So under that strait, under that water, there's never been an incident where there has been a leak. Pipelines do leak after a while. Americans mm -hmm. have millions of miles of pipelines, far more than Canadians, and they've built out more pipelines in the past five years than we've built in our entire life here in this country. Nevertheless, we're still a larger uh, supplier of, and producer uh, and, and res, uh, reserves of oil than they are. That aside, I think the reality is this is going to court. If it is successful, then no problems. If it's not successful, shut down Ontario, shut down Quebec and part of the Maritimes, especially propane, especially our petrochemical sector. This will bring Eastern Canada to its knees. I hope we're aware of that. <laughs> may not be. And that's the yeah, problem. we may not <laughs> be. Okay, a couple of other things I want to, well, two or three other things. You, you, you've you done a study or you've looked at uh, the CFS, the Clean Fuel Standard, which you say is the next carbon tax. Again, what's your assessment of where we are in that? Well, the Pan-Canadian Framework, a big word that came out in 2015 to honour the objectives of the Paris Climate Agreement, said that we would have to go further than the existing carbon tax and apply a tax to the entire life cycle of all uh, hydrocarbons, of all fossil fuels. So coal, which is a solid, 
uh, things like gaseous, which of course be natural gas, propane, and liquids, your diesels, your gasolines, your aviation fuel, and so on. What the government has suggested this should be is under the rubric of a clean fuel standard. The problem is that Canada already has achieved clean fuel. So it's dishonest for the federal liberals to characterize it as that. Uh, and in particular, recognizing that uh, there has been no serious air violations caused by car, uh, cars or automotive or transport or industrial emissions in, 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 de in about virtually decades. Uh, it seems to me that uh, what they're trying to do is to say, attack the word clean fuel because everybody likes it. That's, you know, that's uh, mother's milk, as they say. Right. The reality here is that it's far more deadly for Canada. It means a second carbon tax, which most economic, uh, green economic uh, uh, professionals and those in the, in the, in the know would say is, uh, is counterproductive to the existing carbon tax. The second problem, of course, is that it means a significant amount of dislocation. Uh, our study, which we commissioned this summer by LFX and Associates, and so far has not been attacked by any of the green groups, which suggests to me that the economics is absolutely bulletproof, uh, puts us at a disadvantage. We'll lose 30,000 jobs. We will not see uh, anything more than another four to $500 added to the cost of every worker in Canada. We're likely to see a significant slowdown uh, in terms of, uh, of capital in this country, 30,000 jobs, as I mentioned earlier. But more importantly, uh, at the end of all this, it will achieve zero in terms of emissions reductions. That's because we're going to continue to see an economy growing. And even if you tax people so they can get to work in their cars, they still have to get to their cars. So all you're doing is taking away disposable income from people and putting it and knocking it somewhere down the line. By the way, the second carbon tax, which mm -hmm. could come into effect because it's almost about to be gazetted either next Saturday, December 5th, or the following Saturday, December 12th, after the House rises, of course, and there's no debate, uh, will likely uh, will come into effect uh, January 1st, 2022. So the cost of living, natural gas going up 60%, gasoline probably another 18 to 17 cents a litre uh, is likely to de deliver a significant blow to the Canadian economy. But this, of course, is what happens when you have no oversight, no interest. It's a very dangerous piece of legislation. Uh, Liberals are committed to it because of their new net zero idea, 2030 to 2050. Uh, of course, the country just doesn't have the money for this. And I think a lot of people are going to wake up to a very brutal reality in 2022. It's called affordability. And that will be certainly thrown out the window and compromised. I want to go on to the question of nuclear. First, I want to correct something, though. I said Minnesota because I think I had Saskatchewan on the brain. I mean Michigan, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Governor Whitman. Um, but on the nuclear question, that is, I mean, Ontario, for example, has made that transition. Certainly there's lots of interest in about it in my part of the world, particularly the small uh, movable yep. uh, reactors, that this could change the game. Uh, what's your assessment of whether or not there's the political will to do that and whether or not it is the answer? Well, I think it's the answer. I was a member of Parliament, as you quite correctly pointed out, for 18 years in the first commercial nuclear reactors built uh, and started in 1970. We've lived an entire generation on nuclear. It's uh, emissions free. Yes, there's concerns about where you put uh, the the uh, spent uh, cool. uranium rods afterwards, but for uh, the past half century, this country and this province has had among the lowest hydro rates anywhere in North America until it was messed up by Gerald Butts Kathleen Wynne, and more importantly, uh, the Premier at the time, uh, Dalton McGuinty, in their attempt to uh, try to be trendy and uh, force high, higher rates by introducing unreliable renewables. I think nuclear continues to be the only realistic uh, energy that supports both sides who have an economic concern and those who have an environmental concern. If we can make those smaller and bring them to communities around northern parts of this country, which do not have the benefit of either high winds or uh, solar for a good part of the day, then I think it's a win. I hope the technology is, uh, is, is taken seriously. I see several provinces have signed on, Saskatchewan, Ontario, yep. even Quebec. So let's, uh, let's, don't just think about it, let's do it. Uh, I read with interest a couple of weeks ago, Shell uh, said, and I think it's the first to offer offsets for CO2 uh, to their customers. They are saying people want to try and make a difference when they purchase their gasoline for their cars. And they've given them, I, at no extra cost, I believe, uh, an ability to opt out or have those uh, have the, the purchases offset. Um, 
do you think that kind of thing is going to make a difference and and catch on? Well, I think it's a smart way of corporations catching on to you know what our children have learned for the past twenty years that the uh, the world is in very serious trouble and carbon uh, emissions are going to bring the world to an end. Um, I, of course, I'm there's a bit of hyperbole in that, but the reality mm -hmm. is that it's a corporate decision uh, because it has sort of flair. Uh, but I think the big reality is that you are already paying a carbon tax of 6.62 cents a liter. It's going to go to 8.89 cents a liter, then up to 12 cents a liter uh, come uh, January, uh, every April 1st, April, April Fool's Day. Why the bureaucrats chose that day, <laughs> I'll leave it to them, but it's the only amount of humor I find in all this. The reality, I think, is that... Uh, Companies that want to jump on the woke bandwagon will do so um, and have a big publicity uh, stunt around it. But I would suggest that if they want to plant trees, if they want to see the, you know, as being, you know, social corporate do-gooders, that they actually might want to spend a bit more time, re you know, applauding, recognizing, and informing Canadians of the significant advances that have been done in terms of production of energy in this, can in this country. It's, a, it's an important message because they don't tell it enough to people. One of the funny ones that I get, uh, that if Imperial Oil were to do this, I always like to remind my green friends that it was Imperial Oil, ESSO, that discovered the lithium battery, the very thing that's revolutionizing the EV. So I think rather than spending right. the time trying to be woke, maybe they want to spend the time informing and educating. I'd be certainly a, a part of that. I'm not a fan of the oil sector, as you know, I took them on, certainly in the downstream when they were crushing a little independence out of uh, their, life, uh, their life savings. But I also recognize this is a vital industry for without which, and for the foreseeable future, according to the law of physics, you can't replace hydrocarbons unless you want to shut down the entire economy and reduce two thirds of the world's population. And it is the bigger players because they can afford to, which are doing, they're the ones doing the research on greener solutions to what's going on. Nobody wants to create the mess or leave the mess or pay for the mess. So it makes sense to prevent the mess if you can. Yeah. Look, they do have that. Uh, I worked prior to being elected to uh, public relations for Toyota Canada. We brought in uh, a little car called the Tsunami in 1990. You'll know <laughs> today is the Prius. So yep. 30 years ago, we've been on to then let technology evolve, let things happen uh, because the public wants that. And, and uh, you know, the certainly objectives can be met uh, as long as there are benchmarks that are put in place, not you know, hammered into, uh, into taking a company hammering into oblivion or to come out with artificial benchmarks that we're seeing with this federal liberal government, but ones that are realistic. Uh, look, there's no point in Canada trying to be trendy when it's trying to break away from what its neighbors and what the relevant market is doing. I saw this play back in 2004 when the liberals tried to remove sulfur uh, from gasoline. The problem was that uh, you could do that. The Americans were eventually going to get to that point, but uh, they weren't going to do it uh, on the timetable that Canadians had suggested. We shut down two, not one, but two refineries in Canada, and it increased the cost of fuel by about 5%. So let's be careful. There's a cost of being trendy. We're all in and on the same page. It's how we get there and how we allow industry to find the ways, the means to make technology possible so that all of these things are, are, you know, are, are very much uh, you know, part of our agenda and we can achieve those things. I always try to say we have to be pragmatic. I belong to a liberal pragmatic party. It is not a pragmatic party. It's a very doctrinaire party. It's for that reason I have concern. Do you think we'll uh, ever see the decision on Energy East change? Uh, no, I don't think we will. Um, but I think it would be awfully decent uh, if we mm -hmm. took the existing main line and turn it to a crude line. If uh, Michigan Governor uh, Gretchen Whitmer gets her way and blocks off that pipeline, we better find, up, find something really soon. Because otherwise, we're going to wind up without fuel. And it's not just a question of price. It's just an availability. Someone said to me, well, you know, you have pipelines going to the United States. Yeah, and American jobbers are going to be the first ones to be given a priority. Americans will look after themselves long before Canadians are given that opportunity. But I, again, am somewhat peeved, if not, say, alarmed at the, uh, the, the disconnect. This should be an issue that's right front and center uh, as far as uh, our viability of our energy sector here in eastern Canada. Uh, and the fact that, uh, you know, just last year when we had the rail strikes and propane shortages were only hours right. away, 
This is far worse than that. All of the propane that would go to Ontario, all the propane to the Maritimes and to Quebec are very much at risk. And yet uh, there doesn't seem to be a corresponding level of interest uh, by those analysts and media who I think should be spending a lot more time on the bread and butter issues that are of real concern to Canadians, not the phony stuff made up by people who've got a lot of time and a lot of money to imagine a great, wonderful world of magic and make-believe. If memory serves me well, and and correct me, please, if I'm wrong, I think at one point you proposed, or were certainly in favor of a giga tax, uh, that you, uh, you, you know, tax the the big players for the services that we hadn't quite figured out yet. So is there an alternative to the carbon tax? Is there some way to generate that cash to pay some of those bills, if not the carbon tax? The giga tax was actually not my proposal. I was concerned about a giga tax oh, okay. for public consent. And I remember Thank uh, you for uh, downtown that. Toronto, uh, uh, the across from Eaton Centre, telling Jack Layton what it was before he gave a big speech on it. It was quite funny uh, <laughs> at the time when we were in opposition. But that's the kind of rapport I had with, uh, with par- parliamentarians then. Uh, I, there is an alternative to taxing. And uh, I think uh, in this case, if you're going to have a carbon tax, let's settle on having that carbon tax. Uh, and one that is rebated and you increase it accordingly as long as it is rebated so that ultimately it does somehow usher in some kind of uh, uh, putative changes, especially if they happen in the United States. But adding a second carbon tax uh, defeats the very purpose that you're trying to achieve. So let technology work. Let's also celebrate and encourage and develop and get behind some of the great technologies that have been developed in places where we say that we're, we have an emissions problem. So if we're looking at, for instance, the oil sands, then let's, let's, let's work and redouble our efforts on SAG-D technology, the kind right. of stuff that uses a very small footprint. Very clean. Very yeah. we've yeah. Done, and we've done great work. Look at Saskatchewan, Boundary yeah. Dam, many of those, uh, uh, you know, those projects that they have on sequestration. So you don't, throw, you, know, you don't have to basically reinvent the wheel. Let's just make sure it functions a little bit better. Add a little bit of oil to that from time to time. Well, the watchdogs in this country are usually canaries in the coal mine. That you are. And thank you for uh, singing, for <laughs> making some of these comments. We appreciate it. It's been a pleasure, Senator Wallen. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, really good to talk to you again. You take good care. Thanks so much. Dan McTeague.